This man is angry. People say many things, that I'm destroying tradition, that real Japanese tea isn't supposed to be like that. To me, that kind of thinking is old-fashioned. Spellbound by Japanese tea, this native of France strives to tell the world of its beauty. The Japanese tea industry has been thrown into confusion by his presence. If you think about it, tea only came to Japan a thousand years ago, right? It's impossible to change it in only a few short years. For me... I'm not really interested in his tea. It's no wonder. This man's style of tea goes far beyond the limits of what has traditionally been considered acceptable. But a big movement seems to be building. <laughs> delicious. It smells delicious. It's a waste. A complete waste. If things keep going as they are, who will we sell tea to in the future? It will become more and more difficult. The market is shrinking. It's really important for culture to adapt. For now, I'm trying my hardest to ensure that Japanese tea has a future. A future through adapting culture. But is what he makes truly Japanese tea? What do you think? Isa Now, Japan, a rediscovery. Tokyo's Kichijoji, top of the ranks for most desirable place to live in Kanto. This man has made his home base here in this area that is overwhelmingly popular, particularly amongst young people. French-born Stéphane Danton, after coming up with the idea of making flavored teas using Japanese tea leaves, he opened his own store in Kichijoji in 2005. That flexible and audacious idea gathered attention from all quarters, and he is continuously receiving requests to attend conferences. In 2011, for his many contributions to spreading the appeal of Japanese tea, he won an award from the World Green Tea Association. Exactly what is Stefan offering us? What is this new way of drinking Japanese tea? Chocolate mint. If you decoct the chocolate mint tea in milk, it's good. Milk? These aren't words normally spoken in a specialty tea shop. Delicious. It smells delicious. Stefan pulls out box after box, each full of tea to show his visitors something they may like. Most of the flavors are hard to associate with Japanese tea. Flavored Japanese tea. It's Japanese tea with flavors added. Flavored Japanese tea. Stefan adds flavors and aromas to various types of Japanese tea. He has more than 30 types on offer.
For example, this green tea has a fresh, sweet and tart aroma with the flavor of summer Mekon. This is roasted apple. A subtle sweetness is added to an aromatic roasted tea base. This gentle tea warms the heart, making it perfectly suited to a cold winter day. Pouring this cold brewed tea into a wine glass gives it a splendid appearance. When Stefan expanded the boundaries of what a soft drink could be, he caught the eyes of the restaurant industry. For Expo 2008 in Spain, he provided a Valencia orange flavored tea that was the official drink of the Japanese pavilion and it was received to great acclaim. In truth, Stefan began developing his flavored teas as a way to introduce Japanese tea to people overseas. But it was like opening the lid to Pandora's tea box and it became incredibly popular among the Japanese too, especially among younger customers. This is Kyoho grape. Wow, the grape smell is really strong. Yeah, it has a strong Kyoho smell. Stefan's tea has a surprising ability to break down preconceptions and inspire excitement at forging into uncharted territory. For those who are unfamiliar with Japanese tea, it serves as an excellent way to get them interested. We didn't used to be in the habit of drinking it at home, but now we do. The store was like the catalyst. The taste really suits the Japanese palate. It's not too strong and has a nice aftertaste. I thought it was great. Stefan showed us the process he uses to make his flavored teas. Here he is making mint chocolate tea. The base is roasted tea leaves to which he adds chocolate flavor, mixes in some black tea to give it a subtler flair, and he gently blends it all together. Then he adds the peppermint. To give it a refreshing appearance, he adds cornflower petals. He adds another touch of class with silver drage confectionery balls and mixes it well to spread them evenly throughout the tea. It's an exquisite blend based on Stefan's highly refined sensitivity. If what I make doesn't look good, I can't sell it. My ultimate goal is for people to think it tastes good. That's my ultimate goal. But I need a way to convince customers to drink it. I do that with decoration, with aroma. Let's travel back to Stefan's youth, where we can get a glimpse of where his passion for flavored tea came from. Stefan was born in Lyon, one of France's foremost gourmet cities. He was raised in a corner flower shop in the shopping district. When I came home from school, since it was a flower shop, the smell of flowers was always there. We put out the Christmas tree and the whole shop would smell like a forest. In the spring it would smell like lilies. When I went into the back of the shop, I could smell food cooking, the food for dinner, the smell of melted sugar and butter used to make apple pie. That's the environment I was raised in, always surrounded by different aromas. Being raised in a city of gourmet and surrounded by different scents in his everyday life, Stefan eventually received his qualification as a wine sommelier. He came to Japan in 1986 to help spread the word of wine in Asia. The plane took the long way here. France to Frankfurt, to Cairo, to Karachi, to Beijing, to Tokyo. It took ages. It was unmistakably flying. If someone asked me to do it again, I probably wouldn't. 
but it was fun at the time. But when I got here, it was a bit... it wasn't easy. I felt that as soon as I arrived in Narita. From the beginning, I had problems with the language, and it was very hard. He decided to stay and spent a year learning Japanese before returning home. But he decided to give it another try and came back to Japan. He couldn't find a job in wine, but ended up working at a French tea company that also dealt in Japanese teas. That was when he first made the acquaintance of Japanese tea. The first time I tried it, I had deep steamed tea. It was strong. Basically, I didn't like it. It just didn't suit me at first, because it was something that wasn't a part of my own food culture. But everyone told me that there were different kinds of Japanese tea. So I decided to experiment with some others. Once he began, Stefan learned that just like wine, Japanese tea has various types and regions and different depths of flavor, and this created a spark of interest. At the same time, he learned that this information is not commonly known. At some point, he realized that he wanted to tell more people about Japanese tea, and suddenly an idea of how to do that hit him, flavored teas. It's just like with wine. You look at it with your eyes, then you bring it up to your nose. If your nose tells you that it has an interesting aroma, then the next step is to bring it to your mouth. It's always these three steps, eyes, nose, mouth. This is incredibly important. And if I could make use of that process in enticing the customer, even in green tea, I would succeed. That's the way I do it. Today, Stefan has been invited to a symposium called Tea Trends. Domestic demand for Japanese tea leaves is falling. The amount of green tea purchased per year is now half what it was 50 years ago. The situation is serious. For those in the Japanese tea industry, just how to increase demand for tea as a part of culture, as a part of custom, has become a big topic for discussion. Stefan is blazing his own unique trail and tends to stand out among those industry professionals. Of course, I don't think Mr. Danton's method is bad. I think it's really good. But the question is whether it is necessary to use Japanese tea in flavored teas. It's going to quickly criticize, but I think it's obvious that it should be used. It's an ingredient, a material. I'm not saying don't use it. I use Japanese tea so I can introduce people to it. Flavored tea gives people the chance to drink good Japanese tea. I opened a door. Japanese people are really bad at opening doors. Each and every person connected to Japanese tea culture has their own way of doing things. Stefan truly loves tea, combined with the fact that he's very serious about it, has led to conflict. I think what you're saying about aroma adds a really interesting dimension to it, but in the end, I'm wondering if that idea can really take root in Japan or not. The only thing I want to say is this. I'd like to show you the customers at my shop. They're all women and young people. These are the people who will buy tea in the future. If you want to keep doing it the normal way, please do. You're free to do so. But everyone here truly loves tea and perhaps doesn't like my tea very much. That's fine. Because I'm making tea for people who've never had tea before. With his own unique point of view, Stefan is trying to cut deep into ideas of the tea world. His view of Japan is what is making him do so. Japanese people are too conscious of their own culture. It's important to remember it. It's important to care for it. But that's not everything. It's really important to adapt culture. For culture to develop, we must care for it. But that is not enough. 
it must adapt. Tea was originally brought over to Japan from China as medicine, and it was considered a very valuable commodity. Eventually, it became a luxury enjoyed by nobility, then the samurai class, and finally the common folk. This happened because tea changed with the times to meet the needs of the people, adapting in various ways to become what it is today. If we understand that tradition and culture are things that have been built over time, changing as they went, it becomes easier to accept that perhaps they should also be adapted to meet the needs of the modern day. We have to be flexible. Flavors provide added value. Flavored teas can serve as a route to awareness for people who know nothing about Japanese tea. They will start looking into it. That's where it starts. And that's when culture starts to spread. Stefan's adaptation, flavored teas. Perhaps this is a way to protect Japanese tea culture at the same time as it opens a path to the future. It is late July. Stefan is thinking about taking things to a new level. This is a commercial complex in Tokyo's Nihonbashi area called Koredo Muromachi. Plans are in motion for him to open a new shop here this fall. So this here is for the takeout area. Oh yeah, so it can be seen as soon as someone comes in. Nihonbashi was the center for a great amount of Japanese culture during the Edo period. Here is where Stefan hopes to take on his next challenge. I'm thinking of a new tea for Koredo. It's champagne flavor. Champagne tea. We'll put in some carbonate powder and then hibiscus so that the tea becomes carbonated. That's something I'm thinking about selling. He has a very powerful personality and is smart, but what I really felt was his passion for tea. One part of the concept behind redeveloping the Koredo Muramachi area is tradition and innovation. So his idea really fits that concept, in that he's changing traditional Japanese tea in innovative ways. Stefan returns to Kichijoji and quickly gets started on developing his newest, original flavored tea. Here is his first experiment. His powerful convictions have strong roots and give bloom to rich, beautiful creations. After Stefan became involved in Japanese tea, one place in particular took on some importance for him. This is Kawane Honcho in Shizuoka Prefecture. Known as the home of Kawane tea, every year it produces high quality tea leaves. A majority of Stefan's flavored teas are made using Kawane tea which contributes greatly to his love of the area. Is anyone home? Hello? Today, Stefan is meeting one of the people who produces that tea, Etsuro Masui. Stefan believes that direct contact is important to understanding the situation in the tea fields. Close interaction is the key to their good relationship. Personality, just what I thought a Frenchman would be. <laughs> he likes to talk. He's nice. He won't say I'm noisy. 
I'm a tea grower. So at first, I didn't get why he was into flavoring it. He really values what is good about Kawane tea. But to get the average person to drink it, he said he wanted to open the doors a bit wider and provide tea more suitable to the eyes of today's consumers. He taught me something that would have been difficult for someone in the tea industry to realize on their own. Everyone is making a great product. Every year they provide the same quality. Every year the environment is different. One year there's lots of snow, one year is really hot. But each grower is putting out tea of basically the same quality every year. That's how good they are. Consistency from careful attention to one's work. This is Japanese quality. Stefan has a deep understanding of this and a great respect. His desire to spread the word of Japanese tea grows daily and to bring greater acceptance among even more people. He makes sure to always be flexible and to his methods evolving. Because that's his style. Cheers. Good work today. When his work is done for the day, he makes his way to one of his favorite restaurants. Before we realize what's happening, he is behind the counter himself, a familiar part of the restaurant scenery. <laughs> Stefan Danton, a man who adds a splash of color to the culture of Japan.